Our story begins as a kid gets beaten up by his stepfather for taking too long to eat and for looking like a gloomy little brat. The kid apologizes repeatedly, but his father just keeps hitting him and his mother sits nearby without caring. This is a dream from the past of our protagonist Mamori, and he wakes up to find his class president getting bullied. The bully is Shogo, and he refuses to give class president Ayaka her book back. Shogo teases her more by reading some of the romance novels to everyone, and all the other students just ignore the bullying. The class is on a field trip, and Mamori can't help but notice how all his classmates are just keeping their heads down to ignore the bullying, while the class elites laugh away. Meanwhile the teacher doesn't really care about anything, and just sleeps the entire time. Mamori thinks he might look pretty cool if he intervened, but Mamori remembers that he is just a nobody, and he wouldn't accomplish anything. Ayaka eventually gets really frustrated, so Mamori surprisingly stands up to Shogo, and tells him to give Ayaka her book back. Shogo is impressed that Mamori is finally standing up for something, but he still refuses to give the book back, and now Shogo wants to bully Mamori as well. Just then one of the students named Kurihara tells Shogo to stop messing around because he is irritated by all the arguing. Everyone thinks Kurihara is cool for taking command of the situation and Shogo apologizes to Ayaka. Shogo is still annoyed about Mamori standing up to him so Shogo starts bullying the quiet kid in class. Finally the teacher tells him to stop and says that Shogo can bully people when he is not the teacher. Mamori actually agrees with Shogo because standing up like that isn't like him at all, and Mamori assumes that he only took action because of the dream he had. Just then, all the students are shocked when they are teleported to a strange place. Some lady calls them heroes from another world and introduces herself as a goddess named Viseus. Goddess explains that in her world, whenever the great demon emperor appears, they summon heroes from another world. The great demon emperor was defeated by heroes 200 years ago, but the terrifying evil has just resurrected. These students are heroes to her, so the goddess asks them to lend her their power. The students don't believe that they have been teleported to a different world, and just assume that they are dreaming. They start to think that it's just a prank, or even worse that they may have all lost their lives in a crash. Everyone begins to panic, but the teacher tries to calm them down by pointing out that he is there. He is useless though, and just says that they should listen to the goddess. Mamori takes a look around at all the old stuff, and the golden eye of the goddess makes him believe that they really are in some other world. Kirihara wonders what will happen if they don't agree to fight the demon emperor, so the goddess reveals that they won't be able to return to their world. The only way to do the reverse summoning ritual is by using a special element known as the evil element, and there are only two known ways to obtain it. One is by obtaining the heart of the demon emperor, and the other is by collecting the demon emperor's essence, which is released when the demon emperor is defeated and putting it into the crystal necklace. Shogo gets annoyed about being forced to fight the demon emperor, but the goddess begs for their help, as they are the heroes of salvation. Ayaka points out that they are just normal humans, and pretty far from being heroes. The goddess assures them that they have powers that others do not possess, but Mamori can't help to think that something isn't right. Shogo is sick of the prank already, and Mamori realizes that the goddess is what is upsetting him. Just then the students are horrified, when a prisoner is brought out to be eaten by a monster. The goddess incinerates the monster with the fire spell, but the students are still in denial and just do not want to believe that her attack is real. The goddess changes the subject and declares that it's time to reveal the hidden skills of all the students. All the students take turns touching a crystal ball, and when it lights up it means that they have a special ability. The summoners are shocked when Shogo's light grows brightly, and it means that he has an incredible power. Shogo changes his mind on the entire situation and now thinks that being a hero sounds great. Kirihara is up next and the sorcerers can't believe what they see when his power shatters the crystal ball. This means that he is the S rank, which is the ultimate rank. Shogo is an A rank, so he points out how Kirihara is better than everyone, no matter what world they're in. Ayaka is an S rank hero as well, and the goddess is shocked when they find that there is a third S rank among the heroes. Normally they are lucky to just get one, so Goddess declares that this is the best summoning ever. Mamori is next, and he doesn't know what it means when he makes the crystal glow purple. Mamori also notices that his glow is the weakest out of everyone. Mamori wants to know what rank he has, but the Goddess just ignores him. Mamori realizes that he is no one again, just like in his old world. 
so he decides that he is fine with it. Just then Tomohiro of the class makes the crystal glow with a black color. The goddess explains that this happened only once before, when the dark hero touched the crystal, and he ended up being one of the strongest air rank heroes of all. Tomohiro laughs like a psycho, and declares that he knew his time would come soon. Afterwards the goddess shows everyone how to check their stats. Mamori notices that his stats seem pretty low, and he has a unique skill called status ailments. Unique skills can only be used by the individual who has them, and the heroes can awaken more later. Shogo gets tired of the explaining, and he wants to start doing hero stuff. The teacher tells him to be more respectful to the goddess, but Shogo tells him to quiet down, because the teacher is only a D-rank hero. Then the goddess says that there is only one ritual left to do, and she shockingly calls to Mamori to step forward. Mamori has no clue why, so the goddess explains that Mamori is the lowest rank of all the heroes that have been summoned, and Mamori is an E-rank. Past experience has taught the summoners that the weakest hero always holds back the others. Because of this they decided to start getting rid of the weakest hero every time they did a summoning. Eventually though this started scaring the other heroes, so the summoners decided to do something different instead. They decided to grant even the lowest ranked hero one chance to survive. They put them to the test by teleporting the weakest hero to some ruins. If they survive and reach the surface, then they are allowed to live freely. Mamori wonders how dangerous the ruins are, but no one really knows. They have sent countless criminals and heroes to the ruins, but none have returned. These ruins are called the Abandoned Ruins. Mamori tries to get out of it by explaining that he has a unique skill, but the goddess explains that status ailment skills like his are pretty useless. They have a low success rate, and even when they work they don't do much, and their duration is too short. The goddess points out that his stats are also really low, and even if he levels up, they won't improve much. Mamori defends himself by pointing out how unfair it is to have been summoned only to be punished, but Kurihara tells him to just go already. All the others tell him to hurry up as well, but Mamori feels a bit better when Tomohiro asks if he is okay. Tomohiro is the quiet kid in class, and he is always kind to Mamori. Things have changed though, so Tomohiro reminds Mamori that he is the lowest rank. Tomohiro refuses to talk to such a low rank, and he calls Mamori an abandoned hero. Mamori couldn't feel any worse, and the goddess began the ritual. Every hero is granted a unique item when they are summoned, but Mamori gets some pathetic looking leather bag. The gem on the bag will glow when magic is poured into it, but that is all it does. Just then Ayaka surprisingly stands up for Mamori, but the goddess knocks her out to silence her. The goddess tells everyone to forget Mamori, because he is a goner. Goddess considers the heroes to all be winners, and she tells them to watch the tragic fate that awaits losers like Mamori. Mamori finally shows some determination as he becomes furious and uses a paralyzing spell on the goddess. It doesn't work though when goddess reveals that as a goddess, she has a dispelled barrier active constantly. It provides total defense against status ailment spells. Goddess says farewell to the trash hero, but everyone is stunned when Kurihara uses an attack spell. Kurihara apologizes because he was just testing it out. The ritual continues, and everyone is just glad that their time won't be wasted anymore. The goddess wonders if Mamori has any last words, but Mamori just begins to cry. Just then we see Mamori talking to herself. Mamori is sobbing and his other self tells him that no matter how much he represses it and pretends to be a harmless person, he won't be able to hide his true self forever. Mamori tells himself to show everyone his true colors, and to show them the true self that he has been suppressing the entire time. Mamori's true self is finally revealed when he ditches his weak persona and he starts cursing at the goddess. Everyone is shocked and Mamori declares that if he makes it back alive, they all better be ready for him. Mamori is teleported to the ruins, but it's pitch black, so he pours magic into the gem and begins exploring. Just then Mamori barely manages to dodge an attack from a monster and he runs for his life. Mamori shivers as he runs, because he can tell that the gap in power between him and this monster is huge. Mamori is terrified, and he tries to hide the glowing gem, because he thinks it is what's attracting the monster. As he runs Mamori realizes that he isn't actually afraid. The emotion he is feeling is frustration. Mamori has no weapons, and all his stats are garbage. His skill is also useless, so Mamori determines that this is where his life ends. However out of nowhere, 
Mamori finds some determination. Mamori declares that he wants power, and uses a paralyzed spell to stop the terrifying monster right in its tracks. The surprised Mamori runs for his life, and thinks about how the goddess said that status ailment skills rarely worked. Mamori wonders if it is a miracle, but his attention quickly turns to the new monster in front of him. Mamori can feel its hostility, and it's overwhelming. Mamori wants to live though, and Mamori surprises himself when his paralyzed skill works again, this makes him realize that using his skill the first time, wasn't just a miracle, and Mamori begins to wonder if his ability is something completely different from the magic in this world. Mamori is all out of the mana that heroes were given, and he barely has any of his own magic power left. Mamori fears that it won't be enough to use his skill, but Mamori is surprised when he is able to cast a poison spell on the monster. His success rate seems to be really high, and it doesn't even look like the monster's rank matters. The duration seems to be pretty long as well, and Mamori tells the monster not to be upset with him because it was trying to take his life too. Mamori is completely out of magic power now, so he wonders what will happen if he tries to use his status ailment skill again. Just then the monster from before reappears, and Mamori wonders if someone will show up to rescue him. However Mamori thinks about how everyone treated him so poorly earlier, and Mamori remembers how he was beaten as a child. Mamori's years of frustration reach their peak, and Mamori realizes that he is just a background character, so no one is coming to rescue him. Mamori knows he can't rely on others, so his only option is to fight to survive. Mamori's inner self wants to conquer everything, so he declares that his fight for survival starts now. Mamori uses a paralyze on the monster, but it doesn't work, so his system explains that he cannot repeatedly apply the same skill to the same target. Mamori desperately searches for another skill, and puts the monster to sleep. Mamori can't use the same skill on the same target, but he can stack multiple skill, so Mamori finishes the monster off with poison. Mamori feels pretty fatigued, so he realizes that consuming his natural magic power must be getting to him. Just then Mamori is horrified when a group of monsters appear before him. Mamori determines that he will have to go all out and risk using all his magic power if he wants to survive, so Mamori uses Paralyze over and over again. It works, but Mamori is getting dangerously close to being completely out of MP. Mamori is beginning to faint, and things get even worse when more monsters arrive. Mamori realizes that he can't worry about how much magic power he has left, so Mamori uses Paralyze several more times. It keeps working but there are several more monsters left, and Mamori is at his limit. Mamori refuses to just give up, and tries to squeeze out one more attack. It's not looking too good, but Mamori receives a stroke of luck, when Mamori just happens to level up. Mamori's magic power is restored, so he quickly uses Paralyze again, just in time to save his own life. Mamori realizes that he got a huge burst of experience, from that last monster just now losing its life, and Mamori gets excited because this means he can fight again. Mamori uses Paralyze repeatedly, and the skill eventually rises to level 2. Mamori wonders how the leveling system works, but Mamori quickly realizes that he needs to pay attention to the battle. Just then Mamori notices that he can now target multiple opponents at once, so Mamori paralyzes a ton of monsters. Mamori determines that the goddess might be the only one his unique skill doesn't work on, because his success rate in the abandoned ruins has been 100%. There are no target marks on the monsters further back, so this means that his status ailment skill has a limited range. Then Mamori pass through and poisons the paralyzed monsters. They seem pretty harmless now, and Mamori just sees them as experience points this way. Mamori checks his stats, and it shows that everything multiplies when he levels up. Mamori's starting MP was high already, and it is increasing rapidly. Just then, all the monsters begin falling victim to Mamori's poison, and Mamori levels up several times. Mamori puts several others to sleep, and his sleep skill rises to level 2. Mamori levels up even more when more monsters collapse, and Mamori becomes confident that he can eliminate any monsters that appear. Mamori prepares to continue the battle, but he is shocked when the monsters simply run away from him. Then Mamori finds something to wear from a corpse, and decides that he needs to find food and water. Mamori's search doesn't find anything, so Mamori decides to try to eat the monsters. Mamori's poison skill has worn off, so they should be safe to eat. The monster's skin turns out to be too hard to cut through, so Mamori decides to slice out its eye. It doesn't look appetizing at all, and it is even worse when he bites into it. Mamori just ends up coughing it up, and Mamori wonders if the monster's body is just filled with poison. Things are getting pretty bad, and Mamori determines that this place really is made to end the life of anyone thrown in it. Mamori is starving, but he notices that the light on his bag has changed color. 
It is heavier than usual, and Mamori is shocked when he finds soda and some food inside of it. Soda has never tasted so good, and Mamori digs into the food as well. Mamori doesn't know how his bag works, and he doesn't know if it will produce food again, but Mamori is grateful that it happened. A while later we see that Mamori has just finished taking out a giant army of monsters. They are paralyzed, and now Mamori is just waiting for his poison to take effect. Mamori sits on top of a giant dragon, and determines that it will be any second now. Just then the army of monsters starts to collapse, and Mamori begins leveling up even more. Mamori acknowledges just how gruesome the sight is, and begins to tear up. Just then Mamori has a memory from his childhood, where he dreamed about getting revenge. Mamori knew that he would have to eliminate his stepfather, before he eliminated him. Luckily for Mamori his aunt and uncle eventually took him in, and they gave him a normal life, with the warmth of family. They taught him kindness and empathy, and Mamori thought that he had managed to become like them. However Mamori feels nothing now, and he is not even shaking in terror over taking so many lives. Mamori is starting to scare himself, but decides to just accept who he is now. Mamori buries someone old thing, and leaves it behind as he now decides what to do next. Then Mamori easily destroys an eye monster, and he pours magic into a gem next to a mysterious door. The door opens, and Mamori finds that two people have taken their lives inside the room. Mamori is shocked when he finds all the gems they had on them, so Mamori assumes that he might need them when he returns to the surface. Mamori apologizes to the pair for taking their gems, and Mamori goes to explore the other rooms. After checking a couple of them, Mamori finds a room that is taking a lot more of his magic power than the others. When Mamori gets inside the room, he finds another corpse, and this one left a letter. This person's name was Anglin, and he was known as the Hero of Darkness. Mamori remembers that the goddess brought this guy up, as the strongest of all heroes. His letter reveals that the goddess Vicious sent them there by force. He was no longer needed, and they just considered him a problem. He suspected that he would perish soon in this prison, so he left something behind in case anyone ever found him. Mamori curses the goddess because she says the demon emperor is evil, but she is much worse. Mamori doesn't think he is much different, because he just wants revenge, and doesn't care about saving the world. Mamori finds what the dark hero left behind, and it is a book on the forbidden arts. It is filled with recipes for magical items and weapons. Mamori also finds a scroll of forbidden magic, but he can't read the writing. The great sage went through an effort to hide it, so Mamori determined that it must be a powerful spell. If he can decipher it, then it might be a tramp card against the goddess. Just then Mamori is shocked as one bloody page warns about the Soul Eater. It is the being that took everyone's life in the ruins. Mamori continues exploring and finds a door that seems like it won't open without something being put inside in a locking mechanism. Mamori determines that it is the exit to the surface, but this also makes him realize that the Soul Eater must be nearby. It must be pretty dangerous, as even the Dark Hero couldn't defeat it. Mamori has raised his level as much as he could up until now, and Mamori just hopes that he can defeat it with this skill. Nearby Mamori finds a face, and determines that the orb in its head, must be what he needs to open the final door. This face is clearly the Soul Eater, as Mamori can't even move near it without it shooting him. The Soul Eater doesn't leave any openings, but Mamori needs the orb off its head to escape, so Mamori will have to risk his life to get it. Mamori has to speak a skill name to activate his inflict status ailment, and it has to be loud enough too. There is no time to think though, as the Soul Eater begins moving on its own. This monster is what repelled the strongest hero, and it is the reason for the zero survival rate in the ruins. This monster definitely rules the ruins, which means that this will be Mamori's final fight for his life, in the abandoned ruins. Outside we see that someone has appeared to hide near the ruins. Inside Mamori is surprised that the Soul Eater isn't going after him, and it starts puking something out. This substance turns into disgusting monsters, and Mamori realizes that the Soul Eater is showing him how its victims looked, just before losing their lives. The Soul Eater clearly wants to see how Mamori reacts, and Mamori determines that this is how it entertains itself. Just then the Soul Eater reveals itself to Mamori with a scream, and Mamori starts to paralyze the monsters. Mamori wants to poison them next, but he can't get himself to do it, because they remind him of the people that lost their lives. Mamori declares that he is nothing like this monster, because he could never use human souls as toys. Mamori can't use his poison on things that look like humans, and Mamori declares that he is still a human himself. The Soul Eater seems amused by how much it tortures him, so it creates more of the creatures. Mamori tells them to stay back, 
and Mamori can tell that the Soul Eater is really enjoying his despair. The horrified Mamori begs for the creatures to get away, and the Soul Eater just laughs like a maniac. Mamori is completely hopeless now, and he begs for someone to save him. Mamori can tell that the Soul Eater is enjoying a lot, so Mamori shockingly completely changes his composure and paralyzes the Soul Eater. Mamori explains that he could tell that it was the best moment of the Soul Eater's life. It had found its ultimate prey, that it could torture for maximum enjoyment. However this meant that it let its guard down, and it wasn't able to notice that Mamori never once lowered his left arm. The monster collapses from paralyzation, and Mamori explains the one fatal flaw possessed by those that are arrogant in their strength. The moment they convince themselves that victory is inevitable, is the same moment they give rise to their greatest foe, and that is overconfidence. Mamori's paralyzing skill rises to level 3, and Mamori reveals that he was just acting the entire time. Then Mamori explains that after being taken in by his aunt and uncle, he tried his best to become harmless. Mamori tried to become normal, and he tried to become kind. Mamori even managed to fool himself, and ultimately forgot who he really was. However the kind background character that he became, clearly still had a lot of hostility deep down. Mamori poisons the soul monsters, and explains that he felt nothing towards them when the Soul Eater created them. Mamori is just meeting evil intent with evil, and ending their lives. Mamori had the lowest stats to ever enter the dungeon, but Mamori is grateful for it because it means that he was underestimated, and it is what allowed him to survive. As the Soul Eater is still in pain, Mamori mocks it for losing to a weak human that was sent to the dungeon to be disposed of. The Soul Eater desperately tries to get away, but this just helps Mamori learn that his paralyzed skill causes additional damage when his victim tries to move. Mamori finally poisons the Soul Eater, and the skill rises to level 3. Mamori puts an end to the fight with his sleep spell, and the souls that the Soul Eater was using appear to think Mamori. They were watching him throughout his time in the ruins, and the couple hoped that he would make good use of their gems. Most importantly they thank him for defeating the Soul Eater. The Dark Hero is there as well, and he tells Mamori to get revenge on the Goddess. Mamori knows that he isn't obligated to, but Mamori wants revenge against the Goddess for himself. Mamori takes the orb from the Soul Eater, and uses it to open the exit door, and Mamori says goodbye to the ruins. Outside we see some students are eliminating monsters so that they can gain experience points. Shogo chases a wolf, and Kurihara is pleased with his progress as he reaches level 18. Now Tomohiro watches a monster scream in agony, and he laughs like a maniac. The girl named Iksaba intimidates another girl, and expresses concerns that their class is probably going to fall apart soon. They have a lot of selfish people, and being assigned classes hasn't helped. Iksaba assured the students would start to split into factions, so Iksaba wanted scared girl to join her group. The scared girl is only a D rank, so there is no way she will make it into Kurihara's group, and Iksaba predicts that Ayaka won't live long enough to form her own group. The scared girl's name is Kashima, and Iksaba tells her Kashima you will soon find yourself not fitting in anywhere if she doesn't join Iksaba's group. Iksaba believes that if they defeat the demon emperor, and make it back to their world, then what they do in this world might benefit them. It turns out that the goddess has assigned a test to the students, that requires them to eliminate monsters. Kashima hasn't completed the assignment, so Iksaba has some girls bring out a monster to help Kashima. Kashima is hesitant, but Iksaba reminds her that she will be disposed of like Mamori if she doesn't eliminate the monster. Kashima is horrified, but she has no other choice, so Kashima slays the monster. Iksaba congratulates her on passing the test and announces that Kashima has officially become a member of her group. Kashima feels absolutely horrible, and she remembers a time when Mamori rescued an injured cat. Kashima feels horrible after eliminating the creature, and she apologizes as there was nothing she could do. Elsewhere Ayaka regains consciousness, and Ayaka feels the pain from when she was punched by the goddess. Ayaka goes to speak with the goddess about Mamori, but the goddess explains that there is nothing that can be done. The ritual to dispose of the weakest heroes is a strict policy of the kingdom, and the goddess pretends to be remorseful, as there is nothing she can do. Ayaka is shocked when the goddess reveals that the ritual is still ongoing. While Ayaka was sleeping the days away, all the other students departed on a test to determine if they could eliminate a monster. Several have already failed, and they have been disqualified. The goddess continues to act sad about it all, as she explains that those who cannot fulfill their duty as heroes must take their leave. 
Ayaka expressed her displeasure about how the students are being handled, but the goddess reminded her that they must dispose of those that are worthless. Ayaka reminds the goddess that she is an S-class hero and declares that she will do her duty to make up for the students who couldn't clear the goddess's test. However, in return, Ayaka wants the goddess to call off their disposal. The goddess accepts and apologizes for punching her earlier. Goddess excuses it by saying that she had to calm Ayaka from her confusion, but now she wants to get along. In the dark forest the girl that was outside of the ruins runs from some pursuers. The sword god named Magitz and his group are close to catching her, and we learn that they are known as the White Walker. Mamori finally returns to the surface and looks at his stats. Mamori learns that he can dismiss Paralyze at will, and he can make his poison non-lethal. This means that he will be able to avoid eliminating targets that way. Mamori decides that he needs to find a sword and someone to act as a tank to handle the front line for him. Just then Mamori finds some slimes and the group seems to be picking on one of their own. Mamori hopes that the one getting bullied will stand up for himself, but there is no hope for him as he is outnumbered. Mamori feels bad for the little guy, but Mamori is shocked when he pushes back the bullies. Mamori intervenes to paralyze and poison the bullies, and Mamori notices that he can change the settings on his abilities. Mamori dismisses the effects and tells the bullies to scram, leaving only the little slime. Mamori leaves it paralyzed, and Mamori tells it that he was really impressed by how it stood up for itself. Then Mamori tells it not to attack him, and he sets it free. Mamori says farewell to the little slime, but it just keeps following him through the forest. Mamori can tell that it is an outcast just like him, and it clearly plans to keep following him. Nearby the same girl is exhausted from running away, and she realizes that this is how the White Walker do their hunting. Back with Mamori we see that he has teamed up with the slime, and Mamori is using it to watch his back. Mamori reads the book Anglin left behind, and he learns about an experiment to strengthen monsters. They are forbidden arts, and it even describes how to craft a solution to enhance slimes. Mamori makes it very clear to the slime that he is on a quest for revenge, so following him will mean that this is their goal. Mamori asks the slime if it is okay with that, and the slime is totally on board. Mamori names it Pigamaru, and the little slime has no issue with it. Mamori is determined to get his revenge by any means possible, so he won't hesitate to use forbidden magic and arts. Elsewhere the girl realizes that she won't be able to escape the White Walker, so she decides to use something she didn't want to. The girl offers her sleep as a sacrifice, and after a short incantation, she transforms into what she calls a spirit regalia. Nearby the White Walker runs into Mamori, and they decide to rob him. Magitz would rather test his new sword on Mamori, so the others tell him to make it quick, because they have to go after the girl again. These guys say some disgusting stuff about what they're going to do to the girl, and any other girl they find, so Mamori gets upset. They notice Mamori backing away from fear, so Mamori starts begging for his life. Magitz goes to end Mamori's life, but everyone is shocked when Mamori paralyzes him. Mamori is glad to see that his status ailment skill is effective on humans, and he tells the thugs that they are not even close to being as intimidating as the monster in the ruins. Mamori isn't actually afraid of these guys at all, so he calls them scumbags. Pigamaru is upset as well, and Mamori decides that he won't be bothered if he ends these thugs' lives. Mamori has already decided that from now on, he will meet bloodlust with bloodlust, which means Mamori is prepared to take human lives if he has to. The thugs realize how terrifying Mamori is, but it is too late as Mamori poisons them. Mamori can sense someone else is nearby, and we see that the girl is getting nervous. She no longer senses the White Walker, so she fears that they might be planning something. Just then she is startled, as she senses a different person. Their presence isn't strong, but it's very unsettling, and even the spirits are afraid of them. Just then the girl attacks, but Mamori appears behind her and paralyzes her. Mamori says her intent to attack, but he sensed something else in her, and became curious. Mamori is only keeping her paralyzed as a precaution, so she wonders what he wants with her. Mamori simply explains that he isn't from this area, so he wants her to tell him. Mamori allows her to move her mouth, but Mamori warns that he will paralyze her again if she tries anything fishy. In reality Mamori cannot stack paralyze, and he is just bluffing. Mamori allows her to move her mouth only, as he is still skeptical of her. Mamori has been through a lot, so he doesn't trust strangers so much. The girl agrees to answer his questions, but first she wants to know where the group of four men are. 
She is shocked to hear that Mamori eliminated them, so he wonders if they were her friends. Her shock is for a different reason, so she explains that those four guys were the White Walker. They were very powerful, so she wondered if Mamori had allies helping him. Mamori refers to Pigamaru when he says he has one ally, but he doesn't tell her anything about him. The girl didn't sense any falsehood when Mamori answered her question, so she decided to answer his questions as honestly as she could. She is also grateful for him saving her life, so Mamori explains that she doesn't seem like a bad person. They both agree not to pry too deeply into each other's lives, so Mamori begins with his questions. The girl reveals that the forest they are in is south of the kingdom, and Mamori's next question is about the scroll he found. The girl can tell that it's an ancient and unique script, but she can't read the writing. She does know someone who might be able to read it, and this person is a witch. This witch possessed a vast knowledge of the forbidden things of this world, that she was deemed dangerous. Mamori would like to meet with her, but she can only be found in the land of the golden-eyed monsters. The only problem is that this place is incredibly dangerous. The girl doesn't feel like she has repaid Mamori enough for saving her life. But Mamori says that they are even. The girl is really nice. And she reminds Mamori of his aunt, who is too nice for her own good. Mamori tells her that the paralyzation will wear off in a couple of minutes. But he can't guarantee her safety in the meantime. The girl is fine with it. So Mamori wishes her safe travels and he leaves. Mamori explains to Pigamaru that he doesn't take pleasure in ending lives, so he will only do so within his own rules. Mamori can't be sure that the girl won't attack him after she is freed, so he is counting on Pigamaru to watch his back. So now what will happen next? Subscribe to our channel to find out what will happen next. So friends, if you liked our recap video, then please like and share this video and do not forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you for watching.